All right. So let's look at the structure first. <clears throat> We've gone through this part already, and then second part we started, and we will go through the kind of midpoint of this section, the assurance of salvation. And as a Christian, you pray, right? One of the questions we have for baptism class is, do you read the Bible every day? Do you pray every day? We're not talking about this legalistic point of view of doing something every day. But we're saying, if you're a true Christian, then you will feed off of this spiritual food. If I ask anybody, do you eat every day? Some people may eat twice a day, three times a day. The athletes eat like five, six times a day, right? But you are going to eat usually every day. It's just kind of funny question to ask, right? Yeah. Did you eat last week? What kind of question is that? Yeah. How about last month? Did you eat anything last month? For the past 15 years? No, and sometimes I, I don't remember when, when the last time I ate. Then you cannot survive, right? Same thing, spiritual life, same thing. You cannot skip a spiritual meal and say, I'm well and alive and I'm sound and good and no. It doesn't work that way. So we'll talk about this later, right? Especially today is about prayer. It's prayer. <coughs> right? Who's the ultimate prayer person? Who's the ultimate intercession? Who can do the intercession for everyone? We have a uh, uh, ministry of intercession at churches these days, which is good, but, but are we in, in line with this um, uh, biblical concept? We'll go through that a little bit. So, okay, so far, so far, the Holy Spirit has been doing this. We learned this. Okay, the first one is, He set us free in Christ Jesus from the, the death of this law. <clears throat> Second one is, He dwells in us. Remember, we talked about this one in the combined service. Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, and the Spirit, the Trinity. God is in us. He dwells in us. Witness that we are children of God. We talked about this one a little bit in terms of adoption concept. Instead of having seven human witnesses for our salvation, the Holy Spirit Himself is the witness. He doesn't go anywhere. He's going to witness, be a witness for us forever. So we know for sure, that's what we have assurance in Him, that we are adopted as children of God. The next one is the hope for the redemption of our bodies, the resurrection, right? We talked about it last week. The resurrection, the hope in resurrection that we have because of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God is the one who raised the God, the Son, from the dead. So He will do the same thing for us because He was the first fruit, right? I'm going to read verse 26, and we're going to go to the next slide. <clears throat> verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Too deep for words. So if you look at verse 26, it's basically saying God knows our weaknesses. In particular here, because we do not know what to pray for as we ought. There is the way or things that we're supposed to pray about, but we don't know how to pray. Some people say this, in a way it's, it's right, in a way it's not right. Some people say you have to practice praying then you can be uh, good at praying. Yeah. Which is right. If you practice, you're going to be able to pray better. 
And as you know, if you, if you memorize something, for example, right? If you memorize something, it used to be like this. <clears throat> I'm just giving you this example. Do you guys hear about the, did you guys hear about the assembly line? Assembly line in a manufacturing facility? Yeah. They used to have this, all people lined up. These are the head of people, right? There's an assembly line. Something goes through. So what it, whatever they have to do, they have, each person has their role to put something together. So I, I'm using the same thing, put it in the same place all day long. That's all I do. So let's say this person is a new person in this job, right? This person will have a hard time to keep up with it, even though it's the same thing. It's going to take some time to get used to it. Let's say this person is ready to retire. He's been there for 30 years, putting the same part in the same equipment, for example. Do you think he has to think too much? You don't even have to open your eyes, right? You can feel it. You can just do it, okay, all day long. Time for lunch. I know it. I don't have to see my watch, right? That's how it becomes if you get so used to that. The danger of practicing prayer is that. If you start regurgitating the same words over and over again and thinking that you're praying the right way, guess what? You will do the same thing without thinking. Apostles' Creed, we recite that, right? How many of you actually think about this wording, every single wording of the Apostles' Creed on Sundays? I believe in the God. Okay, do you really, are you really confessing your faith or just reciting it without thinking? I'm not saying that's a bad thing. At least remembering it, memorizing it is a good thing. But practice it so you memorize it and repeat it Mm. you lose the connection with God. But here, Bible clearly says, it's okay. It's okay not knowing what to pray about. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, weakness, for because we do not know what to pray for as we ought, like anything else. We're not good at praying, okay? We don't even know what to ask sometimes. But don't worry. The Holy Spirit, if you're in Christ, He is praying for you. He's praying for you. We'll talk about that a little later, but for now, let's go to the next page. So pray is usually this word that they use, the Greek word. Um, that's how they um, translate. It's direct meaning of the pray, prayer, that word is like supplication. It's supplication. Yeah. You're asking for something. So if you look at the first uh, definition here, it's prayer includes adoration, confession, and thanksgiving. It includes all these things. But the Christian prayer in the New Testament has been essentially petitionary. You're asking something. You're asking something. So if I don't explain further, it sounds like I'm going to ask God to give me something. Again, in a way, it's a right definition. But what we're asking for is what matters the most if we are going to pray that way. Okay? So the Bible explains a little better for us let me put it this way. Verse 26 again. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groan, groanings too deep for words. Groanings too deep for words. This groaning, I looked up a dictionary, the Greek dictionary, People say that groaning 
uh, right? That that's coming when it's like, more like a screaming when you deliver a baby. That type of pain, right? I don't know if you went through some kind of bad pain before. I don't know how it feels like, you know, having a, a baby, you know, thing. But still, what I'm saying is, when you have a really, really bad pain, what else do you think about when you're sick? When you, when you have a big, you know, high fever and you're, you're not feeling well, do you think about your like uh, hairstyle? I don't know, my clothing is not that good. Oh, my body hurts. Do you do that? When your body hurts, when you have this groaning coming out of your, your mouth, you have nothing else in your mind. It just, it, it hurts, right? Think about this. Holy Spirit is not doing, I'm doing all those things. Okay, whenever I have time, I'm going to pray for them, the Christians. That groaning, that beyond the imagination or description of our words, he's focusing on our prayer big time. That much focus, care is already in there. It's very interesting though. If you think about Abba Father concept, <clears throat> If you read Psalms, there's a lot of, there are a lot of prayers in there, individual prayer, especially David. My God, you, know, you are my shield, you're my rock, right? It's a confession of my own um, faith through prayer. Please destroy my enemies, right? They're trying to kill me. They're chasing after me. Lord, please do something. How long, Lord, how can you let them chase after me, right? Very personal, personal um, prayer there, right? So, Old Testament, you know, we have many uh, personal prayer. But in fact, calling Father, Abba Father, right? The God, the Father, Abba Father took place in the New Testament, right? It's, it's funny. They were so personal in their prayer that except for, I would say, Psalm 22, which is not David's own experience, it's really hard to say anybody called um, God as like Father a personal way. It's really tough in the Old Testament, even though the prayers are very personal. New Testament, even though they say it's God, your Father, Abba, Father, the way they pray is really different. It's more like a we, our. I don't know if I'm saying this right because I haven't verified with other church fathers or commentators. But what I noticed was kind of funny. It's not funny. Interesting. Because I want to show you. Let's go to Colossians. Colossians. I'm going to show you the example of prayer. Paul's prayer in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians is after Philippians chapter 1. So if you look at verse 3, there's a subtitle in your bi uh, Bible. It says, Thanksgiving and Prayer, right? Do you see that? Do you, do you still have that? So let, me, let me see this, right? Let me read this for you. We always... Well, of course, Paul is saying, is himself and the other partners are saying this, but he always uses plural pronoun, pronoun, saying, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have all for all the saints. 
because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it, it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, Epaphras, <laughs> our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. This is the intercessor, in the intercessory prayer example, okay? Because he's praying for these people, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Let me stop right there. Verse 9 says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Paul's main point of prayer for his fellow Christians was, so they know God better. That was the main point, right? Verse 9 says, Be filled with the knowledge of His will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We can go on, but let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> verse 27, uh, verse 26. Yeah, verse 27. And he, he who searches hearts knows that is, uh, what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Right? The Spirit intercedes for the saints, for the believers, according to the will of God. If you connect verse 26 and verse 27, first, verse 26 says, we don't know what to pray. The Holy Spirit will pray for us as an intercessory um, uh, prayer. And He's going to pray according to the will of God. We don't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit will pray for us based on the will of God. Not we want, not we need even, according to the will of God. It tells us that a lot of times we don't know what to pray or how to pray according to the will of God. Yeah. That's what it means. We know what we need. We know what we want, right? But the Bible clearly says we do not really know how to pray according to the will of God. Yeah. I've been doing this for at least three or four years uh, about baptism um, uh, class. And I used to just ask, do you pray? Do you read the Bible? And answers are usually yes. I didn't really ask, what do you pray? What's the content of your prayer? Yeah. But the Bible says, of course, we don't know much about it but the Holy Spirit prays in accordance with God's will. That means what? We have to pray according to God's will as well. Think about it, uh, those of you who pray every day. How do you pray and what do you pray about? Based on the example from Paul's prayer in Colossians, it's the same thing, isn't it? He was praying about you guys knowing God better or more, yeah. increasing your um, faith, basically. A lot of people say this. I told you before, too. In terms of faith, right? Prayer, same thing. Faith. Increasing faith with small faith or big faith, you know, large faith, whatever it is, that's not really, a lot of times, not really a biblical expression. Because people use your faith, right? Bible says that too sometimes. But if you look at the entire context, 
what happens is increasing faith is only possible through knowing God more or better, more intimately, right? That's the only way. And people say, my faith is not growing, it's so weak, and whenever I have a challenge, I just fall. The reason is, they don't know who God is. Prayer, same thing. If you keep on praying the same way, or same matters, it, it's tough. Yeah. But after all, we will be doing the similar prayer in most cases, because we are looking for God's wisdom, His mercy, His grace upon us. All those things are according to His will. That's the, pro that's the difference. Some people may pray about financial issues, health issues, their children, husband and wife, same thing over and over again, which is not really, really the major portion of prayer. It shouldn't be. But an another person is praying about God's mercy and grace and love upon us and His guidance and knowing Him more and better, walking with Him. He may say the similar things, but these two prayers are totally different. One's according to the will of God, one's according to your own desire. Yeah. You cannot pray a, a different way all the time. You may repeat the same thing or similar words many, many times, but it is, it is important those wording has to be focused on God Himself, nothing else. Any questions at this point? Anybody praying uh, every day? Sometimes? Sometimes I eat, right? I don't remember when, when was the last time I ate something, right? I don't know, I prayed like this month, uh, maybe uh, two months ago, yeah. Think about it, think twice. If your answer is like that, then you've got to be careful because you're spiritually uh, kind of um, not in a good shape. Okay? Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. I want to show you the example prayer of Paul. And our conclusion is in Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Yeah. It's almost always the same pattern. He does not send a letter to, got to be careful about here, he does not send a letter to evangelize people. What was Jesus' last words in Matthew chapter 28? Go therefore and make disciples, right? Make disciples. What Paul actually does all in all his letters is to the saints, to the believers, to the faithful in Christ, and he actually helped them to become disciples of Christ. Evangelism might be one of the main reasons why he was going around his missionary journey. But his letters show his main focus was to make them disciples. You have to think about that too. When you grow up and go to different churches, for example, think about it. What will be the church's main focus? What should be their focus in their ministry? It's a making disciples. It took some time for us, right, in our church. It's initially, many people did not understand 
about voluntary Bible study. Yeah. Paul is not, Jesus is not going after those people who don't come or join any gatherings. When all those disciples left him, John chapter 6, Jesus turned to his disciples, apostles basically. What did he say? Are you guys going to leave too? Right. He didn't say, go after them. Bring them back here. We're gonna, I'm going to be nicer to them. No, he didn't say that. Are you guys going to leave too? As if. doesn't really matter, right? Yeah. Of course, I'm not saying we can do that all the time, you know. But what I'm saying is, though, the principle is not there that we practice today. I don't know where it came from, really. It, it has to be all-inclusive all the time in today's churches. Then you're not a good pastor, you're not a good Bible teacher, you're not a good leader because you are leaving some people out. Yeah. But nowadays, our church, I think we understand what we're trying to do. Yeah. How does our Bible study work? I ask you guys to pre prepare it, read in advance, be ready to discuss the topics and ask questions, right? If you go to other churches, how many Bible studies do actually people prepare for that their class? Read the material in advance. Do they even know what they're going to be learning next week? Maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. But the Bible, if you look at this, it's all about learning and knowing who God is. We looked at Colossians, right? Um, before Colossians, we have Philippians. Philippians chapter... Chapter 1. It has Paul's prayer, too. Here, let's take a look at Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> verse 8. Verse 8, it says, if you look at verse 3, again, Philippians chapter verse 3, there's subtitle Thanksgiving and Prayer there too, right? Do you see that? Yeah. So it's Thanksgiving and Prayer. So verse 8 says this. It's part of his prayer. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you, earn, yearn for you, all with the affection of Christ Jesus, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. How is it possible? With knowledge and all discernment. It's only possible through that. Through that. Let me find other. Before Philippians, there's a book, Ephesians, right? The one before that is Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. Let's take a look at it too. Verse 15 says, there's a subtitle says, Thanksgiving and prayer again, right? You see that? Thanksgiving and prayer. Verse 15 says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Verse 17, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you. Yeah. Paul's prayer has main theme, a message for these people, the saints and believers in churches. He wants them to be the disciples of Jesus through 
increasing their knowledge about who God is. Sometimes he used some personal uh, word, wording here and there, but most of his prayers is about your relationship with God. He doesn't really talk too much, rare occasion he does, he doesn't really talk too much about a person's health, except the Timothy uh, issue. There was not even a prayer. He said, hey, Timothy, you have to use some wine. But he doesn't really say anything about personal financial issue in his prayer, in his intercession. He doesn't talk about somebody going to Ivy League school either. Actually, he did pray about himself, but God said, uh, my great grace is enough. Right. So sometimes we have to pray for our weaknesses, right? Our weaknesses. What Say is mentioning is found in, let's go to um, 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Yeah, Paul prayed about his own issue. Second Corinthians chapter twelve. Chapter twelve. Verse six. Let's start from verse six. I'm gonna read, okay? Though if I should wish to boast I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. Verse 7, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. A thorn was given me in the flesh. It must be I don't think it was a shingles, but he had this pain in his body, thorn, right? It could be pain, it could be just sickness. A messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So he asked God to heal him from this illness. Verse 9, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For, because, when I'm weak, then I am strong. Okay? Normal people in today's world will not pray this way. Paul said he pleaded to God three times, and he got this message, basically. My grace is sufficient for you. So he's saying, I'm boasting my weaknesses because I'm strong when I'm weak. Meaning God is working through me, through my weaknesses. How about today's church? How would you pray? Three times? You only pray three times about this? You've got to pray until he says, yes, yes, go on. Go back and pray. Until he changes something for you. Until he answers your prayer. What did Paul do? He did not do that, right? He's got the message. When God says no, he didn't argue, okay? That's no. Yeah. So the way we teach in today's church is interesting, to say the least. But sadly, a lot of times it's not biblical. You pray until God answers your prayer. Or provide you with what you want or need. 
Paul did three times, you do 30 times. No, you don't teach that, right? <laughs> so. I mean, what he suffered from a lot of Bible scholars think is not just general pain, but epilepsy. Something like that. Yeah. It's far, far worse than just general pain. Yeah. Maybe as bad as shingle. No, epilepsy, you shake all of them, you foam at the mouth like you're possessed. Yeah. Do they actually feel the pain, though? When, when they, they go through? Black out. Yeah. So I'm not, yeah, that's, I'm not sure if that's really pain. But anyway, so this severe um, illness that he had to go through. It's a lot of speculation about what kind of disease he had, right? Epilepsy was one of those uh, speculative way of looking at it. Yeah. The main point is, though, he was not well health-wise. Yeah. But he was okay with what God showed him in terms of message. So you have to think about this. I'm not advocating, okay, that, that means you don't have to pray too much. No, that's not what I'm saying. You got to pray. What's the main point of Paul's prayer? It's not, main point is not three times he prayed, right? Main point is he got the message. He's got it. It took him only three times of prayer, right? If you do not give up and continue to pray, what happens? You will never get the message. When you get the message of God, meaning if you realize that that's what God wants you to do or to be, then that's when you actually obey to that. He's even saying that he's going to boast about his weaknesses, which was, he, he considered, he expressed a thorn in his flesh. Who wants to boast about their thorn in their flesh? I'm sick. No, no one does it. Think about it, okay? The way we practice our prayer in today's world, the content of our prayer, you've got to think about those things. But all these things, as you look at it from chapter 8, verse 1 through this uh, verse, verse 27 in Romans chapter 8, it's all about the Holy Spirit, His work in us, okay? Right? So, Whatever we do, we have to ask for God's mercy and grace upon us, which is prayer. Am I walking in your, in your direction? Am I walking with you? Am I following you? That should be our main focus of our prayer. It's not about, okay, I'll have a meeting tomorrow. You know, please uh, let me do a good job. Good, good prayer. But that cannot be your main daily prayer about your exams, right? Yeah, I won the lottery. No, I mean, that kind of thing. No, no, don't do that. All right. So, the conclusion is going back to Colossians, as I mentioned. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. So as you know, Paul is, Paul was the, one of the main figures in early church. He's the one who went around different countries and then planted church in today's term. Not just he planted churches, he planted leaders there too. So each church he had leaders. For example, uh, Titus. Just like three chapter uh, letter, right? Titus, he put Titus in Crete, the island. And his letter says, I left you there because I want you to appoint elders in different areas in that island. He trained these people so they can become church leaders as well. Yeah. Mr. No sent me an article this week, past week, about this Korean American churches. And one of the main reasons why they do not really do well, American side, you know, English speaking side, is somehow the structure wise, the leadership, uh, it doesn't really change. They still follow the old fashioned way. Of course, we talked about it. Main reason, main, main reason or cause of that weak church is because the lack of 
the word. Yeah. The article didn't really mention about the Bible, the truth, knowing who God is. It doesn't really talk about it. It just talks about social, um, the structural way of the church. Right? So even though it's not really biblical uh, uh, article, that person was saying that there's a problem with the leadership at, at church. Paul didn't seem to have that issues. He didn't have to manage all these churches. Each church had their own leaders who learned from Paul. Right? Isn't that amazing? Back then, they did not have a phone or internet. So once you taught them, you trust them because they got it. And they are going to start teaching the doctrines that they learned, that they've learned. Since you're in Colossians, I want to show you, if we have time, go back a little more towards the end. After 2 Timothy, there is book of Titus. Since we're talking about Titus, I want to give you some heads up on that. Titus is another book called Pastoral Epistle. First, Second Timothy, and then Titus, okay? After Second Timothy, there's Titus. So First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, they're all pastoral epistle because it talks about church matters, church leadership. And this one, from verse 5, it talks about the qualification of elders. As you notice, um, verse 5 says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order, and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Right? He used the wording elders there. Verse 7, for an overseer, well, you know, are they the same people or different people? It's the same people back then. Elder is, in Greek word, is presbytery. That's Presbyterian church ruled by elders. Overseer here is episcopus, right? It's more like a... Um, people who are managing church. So who are the elders? Ruling the church. They are the ones who manage church. Church matters. Anyway, what are they supposed to be doing here? Verse 9, elder slash overseer slash even pastor, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. And also to rebuke those who contradict it. I had a conversation with my friend exactly one week ago. During the conversation, they said, well, can we just talk about something else? You know, I love Jesus, but I don't like doctrine or theology. So, okay. So how do you know who Jesus is without learning the doctrine or theology or Bible? I've been attending church for a long time, yes. Was Paul, like, foolish to say this to the elders? They had to teach the sound doctrine. Bible says it. But today's church members saying, I don't want doctrine or theology because I love Jesus. That's enough. Yeah. There's a huge disconnect there. And Bible says, you have to teach sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict. So how many people teach sound doctrine, first of all? And if somebody says, that's no, I don't agree with you, and blah, blah, do we actually rebuke them? No. You're right. You're right. He's right. She's right. I'm right too. So we're all together. 
Don't go anywhere. Stay in our church, right? Yeah. I, I don't know how else I can teach this, right? Titus. Very short book. And then the reason why it says this, look at this. Verse 9 again. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Trustworthy word is, grammatically speaking, is trustworthy because... He hold that truth, that word, as taught. Because it was taught in a certain way, that's why it is trustworthy. The English Bible or Korean Bible, they're not clear. The reason why it's trustworthy is because the way it was taught. You hold that because I, apostle, taught you. Now we learn from the Bible. We don't have direct conversation with the apostle or Jesus but we have this word who is God himself so we teach this way the way the Bible says and then it's trustworthy if somebody contradict this sound doctrine they have to be rebuked so Paul was working on these ministries all these letters were saying, do this, do that. If there's anybody who's doing this, rebuke them. Rebuke them. I use this verse many times, so I'm going to have to read this anyway, because since I am in Titus. Let's go to Titus chapter 3. Verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8 says, The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Verse 9, But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Verse 10, as for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with them, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. The English Bible says the person who is stirring up division, but in Korean Bible, heretics. By definition, Heretics are the ones who refuse a sound doctrine. Hence, they cause division in church. Who are the heretics? They are in church, right? They came from church. And they cause division. What do we do? We deal with them once or twice. Then you don't deal with them. But who? It's yeah. usually the heretics who kicks out the... Isn't that the other way around? Yeah. These days, unfortunately, it's like uh, reversed. Unfortunately, though. Um, if it happens, then we have to say what? Hallelujah. Get kicked out from the heretics, and then we're going to have our own church with true believers. Doesn't have to be big. Doesn't have to be a nice building. But as long as we have true believers in it, we will rejoice together. Right. I didn't get to finish my conclusion, but basically, quickly, let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. It's right there. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. I'm going to read it to you, okay? Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So we're teaching all these ministries about having everyone mature in Christ. Verse 29, for this I toil. I do my best, right? I do my best, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. How does he do his ministry? Based on the power given by the Holy Spirit who works in you, works in Him. 
What did he say? I'm not doing anything because the Holy Spirit is doing everything. No, he said, I'm doing my best. I'm toiling, right? But based on the power given by the Holy Spirit who dwells in me. When you study, for example, you do your best based on the power given by the Holy Spirit in you. When you work, same thing. When you preach, you got to do the same thing. It's not your wording or your presentation that will change anything. It's the Word of God that will capture you. The Word of God that will change you. It's not about the pastor or presenter or guest speakers. Okay? So whatever you remember, you got to remember the Word of God that was proclaimed in the sermon or study. Okay? Any questions? <laughs>